Ape Escape is a trilogy of 3D platformers developed by Japan Studio from 1999 through to 2006, exclusively for the PlayStation 1 and 2. With all three games being fairly simple, this will be a compact retrospective, with each title listed as a chapter in the description. I'll be looking at the first game's groundbreaking roots, the sequels that stayed the course, and how the franchise eventually fizzled out at the end of the sixth console generation. Let's begin. In 1999, the Sony PlayStation was dominating the console market globally, with many major franchises to its name. It was a great balance of kid-friendly platformers and the gradual entrance of adult-oriented games. As the sixth console generation was about to wind down, one more platformer would enter the scene from Japan Studio. This developer had been with Sony from the very beginning, putting out Jumping Flash back in 1994 when the PS1 first launched. Five years later, they would put out their most well-known and popular title for the system, Ape Escape. This was my first and only time playing the series back in the day. Having played Spyro and Crash multiple times, the wacky entry was exactly what I needed to revitalize my interest in platformers. Over time, I reached 100% completion and looked towards the PS2 shortly afterwards. Like many games of the time, we start with a brief opening cinematic. A young white-haired monkey named Spectre examines a peak point helmet in front of him. Placing it on his head, it drastically ups his intelligence and he leads his fellow apes out of the amusement park to seek world domination. In this semi-futuristic city, we follow Spike and Buzz as they make their way to the professor's lab to try out his brand new time machine. But the wild apes get there first and hijack the machinery, sending themselves through the portal. The story of Ape Escape is a hint of Back to the Future mixed with a cheesy Saturday morning cartoon, wasting no time before tossing Spike into the prehistoric era. Cutscenes never go beyond a few minutes, adding in occasional side elements, such as Buzz being brainwashed by Spectre, before moving on. One minor detail that always stood out to me was the PAL version voice acting. In the sixth console generation, voice actors would often differ depending on the region, and in the case of Ape Escape, the European version was superior in my book. When listening to the US version of Spectre, he sounds more like a bratty teenager. I only wanted to talk to you. That's why I invited you in. So what do you think of my castle? Do you like it? This castle is the most powerful fortress ever constructed. It will be so easy to conquer the world. It really is perfect, isn't it? But in Europe, he sounds far more devious. So, what do you think? Do you like it? This castle is the most powerful fortress. It will be so easy to conquer the world. When you get into the first level, fossil field or ancient plain in other territories, the gameplay makes a far greater impression. It's all about the DualShock controller, released in 1997 with two analog sticks on top of the existing D-pad a key element in pushing 3D gaming forward. Some platformers like Crash Bandicoot 3 and Spyro 3 had already adopted the new control scheme, but Ape Escape was the very first game to require the controller, making it a core part of the action. The left stick moves Spike and the right controls his gadgets with the shoulder buttons keeping the camera in position. By giving the player this multi-directional movement, the platforming gameplay is always highly intuitive and responsive with every gadget having its own unique use. Press it forward to swing the stun club or net, point it in a specific direction to find monkeys on the radar or guide the RC car, spin it in a circle to use the dash hoop and hover flyer. These methods are far more engaging than pushing a button, and Japan Studio was very forward thinking in this regard. With the jump button mapped to R1 and a training room for each gadget in the time station hub, Ape Escape is very accommodating to new players, while also increasing the level of difficulty at a consistent pace. The only downside to this control scheme is how it places some limitations on playing the game today. If you're looking to revisit Ape Escape without emulation, you'll need a working copy and a PlayStation 1 or 2 console. My PS3 is backwards compatible with previous titles, but Ape Escape doesn't recognize the 6-axis or DualShock 3 controller leaving you stuck on the main menu. Luckily, the game was added to the PlayStation Plus lineup in 2022, making it playable on PS4 and PS5 with full trophy support. 
Layered on top of this control scheme is the core loop of traversal and catching monkeys. It's a game of cat and mouse with many different behaviours and AI patterns. Each monkey is easily identifiable with the colour of their pants and other facial features, with the colour of their helmets showing an alert status. We start off with the basic yellow monkeys who run away at a mild speed, leave bananas for the player to avoid, and occasionally lash out. When playing, you need to get just close enough to swing the net and do it accurately enough to avoid them jumping away. If you're too overly eager, you're likely to take a hit, and if you're too far away, the net swing will miss. On top of all that, the regular enemies, which twist the timeline into some strange shapes, can also get in your way. This is a regular chase pattern that repeats throughout the title, but thanks to the level design, monkey types, and the rewarding gotcha when a catch is made, the core gameplay never gets stale. The dual analog control doesn't just apply to gadgets. In the early levels, Spike will receive a water net for catching monkeys who are swimming. Clicking the left stick makes the protagonist crawl or swim down, which can be a bit fiddly, and clicking the right stick launches a net. Then you have this raft to get past a giant fish. This uses both analog sticks to row, something that had never been seen in games at the time. Circle one stick to turn and circle them both to go forward and back. Spike will gradually progress through time periods from the dinosaurs all the way through to the Ice Age and early days of man. This allows Apescape to conjure up all kinds of unique situations, adding a puzzle solving element to the action. One ape clings to the back of a T-Rex. How do you knock it off for a quick catch? The professor and his assistant Katie offer up some helpful hints via these phone boxes without giving away the complete solution. In other cases, you'll have to come back later when you have the right gadget. The levels are all cleared and unlocked in order, but the way you tackle them is up to you. On the first run, a set number of monkeys are required to beat the stage. At first, it only takes three to five, but further down the line, you'll need to catch at least 10 or more to succeed. Take Tranquil Temple, for example. You can head straight into the main building in the center, but you don't have to. Exploring around the outer areas and down a nearby well can result in separate pathways. As you acquire more gadgets, this also upgrades the levels and the platforming elements. One of the most useful tools is the slingshot, which can hit faraway switches or knock monkeys off of their perch. Up to four gadgets can be mapped to the face buttons for a quick and easy swap, often allowing the player to combine them together. You'll certainly need to do this for the more dangerous monkey types. Light blue monkeys are very easy to catch but are often hidden in the background. Dark blue monkeys are extremely fast and need to be stunned first. The black spectacle monkeys can shoot you with a machine gun. And last but not least, the red and green monkeys are armed to the teeth and can see Spike coming from a mile away. Whether it's hitching a ride on a giant woolly mammoth, hiding inside igloos, or climbing to less accessible places, the monkeys themselves will always keep you on your toes. Some will hop into UFOs and fly all over the place. Others will dive into hazardous water conditions. In later levels, it's very rarely a case of running up and catching them, though you can still use speed, stealth, and the element of surprise. These encounters are often tense as you narrowly dodge their attacks and make the catch before you lose your five hit points, represented by the cookies in the top left corner. But when you place these monkeys against tougher platforming challenges, your skills will really be tested. In a hidden bunker area, one fast monkey and one missile pack monkey must be chased around a circular arena with a bottomless pit. It will take many attempts to catch these quick-footed apes as you make your way round. Other monkeys have to be baited out of cages first using the RC car. By using the monkey radar, you can often get the drop on them, examining their type and behaviour before moving in. In turn, the level design increases in complexity, gradually incorporating more of the gadgets and upping the challenge. When you first receive the slingshot, multiple button switches enter the fray, allowing for different routes to be opened in cryptic relics. The hover flyer allows for more perilous vertical ascent like this one in hot springs. The climb is a tricky one, especially when the ice bridges start collapsing underneath you, but the game rewards your efforts with an easy going jaunt through the sauna at the top. Further down the line, Crumbling Castle is a multi-tiered level with many different platforming sequences and a steady progression that opens up a quicker route to the tallest tower and your ultimate goal. Outside of these components, other hazards like narrow ledges, fall damage, slippery hills and regular enemies all play a role. One of the most unique set pieces is Dexter's Island. This stage appears to be incredibly simple at first, that is until you open the creature's mouth and climb inside. 
What follows is a peculiar yet imaginative set of rooms with floating bacteria and swinging tebrans. Unique designs are another successful part of Ape Escape, as you go back through them again to catch any remaining monkeys or take on the time trial mode, they still engage on a second or third playthrough. Elements that surround the levels are also worth pursuing. Hidden in the background, you'll find Spectre coins that eventually unlock free mini-games in the time machine. They were all quite novel at the time, but nowadays some are better than others. Ski Kids Racing is okay. Using both sticks to control individual directions is a nice addition, and the same also applies to Spectre Boxing even if landing a punch is imprecise. Galaxy Monkey is by far the best of the three, a classic twin-stick shooter that will keep players entertained for a short while. On two occasions, you'll also challenge Buzz to a race with some tightly paced platforming. You don't have to win them on the first try. I didn't, but doing so earns you five extra Spectre coins. Along the way, you'll also take on a boss fight at key intervals. They are fairly infrequent and aren't very complex, but they still cap off the major moments well enough. The first is a giant armoured knight with electricity coursing through its armour. You simply have to run away, then strike after it swings the axe. The original Ape Escape features a great amount of wild personality and silliness, with a colourful and vibrant graphical presentation. The level of variety and precise sound effects are always on top form, even with the occasional dip in frame rate. Finally, the techno soundtrack from Suichi Terada is highly energetic. Every level has a unique track with other repeating motifs that always make their mark. When the professor calls in to introduce each new time period or gadget, the music makes you pay attention. Spike, can you hear me? Something awful has happened. You have slipped in time with the accident earlier. You will soon arrive in the prehistoric era when dinosaurs existed. When Spike returns to the present day, the scene is chaotic, but laced with a sense of determination as he returns to an empty lab. What? The Professor and Casey have been kidnapped yet again and it's up to the player to make their way through the nearby park, a factory, and finally a large skyscraper. The urban environments continue to impress with trickier platforming, such as these large barrels in the sewers, and monkeys being strapped into more advanced machines. You'll even commandeer a tank on the way through for some more dual analog driving. Following a large-scale boss fight with Spectre's flying battleship, we're off to Spectre Land, a huge level with multiple areas and over 20 monkeys to catch. It's a fitting final stage, with Spectre applying his own egotistical vision to a former home. The Wild Western Zone features a squad of tough apes to catch, and eventually will rescue both the Professor and Katie in settings they happen to dislike. The Circus features a brief boss fight with a clown, which tips into a large cage, and in the Haunted House, you'll need to ride a deadly roller coaster down to the bottom before taking on ghosts. Right before chasing down Spectre, Spike and Buzz duke it out for the third time, with the latter strapped inside an awesome looking race car. The setup is much the same as other boss fights, smash the green weak point when you get the chance. With all of Spike's friends rescued, we transition to the second half of Spectreland, a large floating base that quickly ascends into space. There are many individual rooms and challenges on the way through, and eventually things culminate with a robot boss fight. Battling through a first-person perspective was another ambitious sequence, and the second stage has Spike chipping away at the arms and body piece by piece. It feels fairly climactic, with the game hinting that this isn't the ultimate conclusion. Spectre flees the scene afterwards, and this marks the standard ending of the game, with the Professor giving Spike his final gadget, a powerful punch that can smash through walls and these conspicuous boxes the player runs past in some stages. With every item in hand, you can now go back to each level and grab the monkeys you missed. Catch every single one of them and you're off to the final showdown, taking place in an isolated dimension. Spike and Spectre have a final chat before the climax, a space-themed track rocking away in the background. The way the camera focuses on Spectre as he fires off an attack adds some cinematic flair to the fight, and once you knock him out of the chair, it's a case of taking down his shield and stunning him into submission. This final catch is capped off with gusto, and all the monkeys are returned to the amusement park for the true ending.
Despite arriving in the closing years of the PlayStation, Ape Escape was a huge hit both critically and commercially. To this day, it is still fondly remembered for the ways it pushed both its genre and the wider industry forward. Like many fellow platforming franchises, it too would make the jump to the next generation. Following the turn of the millennium, many developers that migrated to the PlayStation 2 started new franchises to branch out and expand the platforming genre, the most notable being Jack and Daxter and Ratchet and Clank. Japan's studio stayed the course, releasing Ape Escape 2 in 2003. It was received positively at the time, though not to the same fanfare as the original. I didn't own a PS2 at that time and stuck to playing Ratchet and Clank round friends' houses instead. Over 20 years later, Ape Escape 2 is a very safe sequel. While the graphics and animations have all improved on the sixth console generation, the game itself offers the same kind of experience, but more. More monkeys, more levels, and a few more gadgets for good measure. If you enjoyed the first title, 2 delivers exactly what you're looking for, but anyone expecting larger leaps forward will be disappointed. Many years after Spectre's first plan was foiled, the Professor has gone on holiday, leaving his granddaughter Natalie in charge of the lab. When a batch of coloured pants are delivered to the amusement park, a set of monkey helmets are accidentally sent as well, triggering another escape and Spectre's second go at supplanting humans. Immediately, the Japanese influence shows a lot more in this game than it did in the original. Spike is gone for the most part, replaced by his cousin Hikaru, known as Jimmy in the American version, and a little floating monkey friend named Pipochi. Despite the 11 plus rating in the UK, Ape Escape 2 is your standard issue kids cartoon. The colours are lighter, the voice acting more over exaggerated, and the music wouldn't sound out of place at a kids party. It's all very light-hearted and quirky, moving away from the blocky techno style of the original. Of course, a lot of that comes down to the upgraded hardware. Everything moves much more fluidly, with Hikaru's hurried run standing out the most. The way he swings the net is more varied and dynamic as well. In turn, this feeds into some refined gameplay additions. The chase to catch a monkey feels more contained and frantic. The large circular arenas are out, and in their place it's more varied monkey behaviour. For starters, they are now much more nimble, outright dodging the net as you try to get close. But to balance this out, they can also trip up, giving you an opportunity to make the catch. The multicoloured pants are still key indicators with the new white monkeys being nearly blind, but able to drop bombs if they spot Hikaru. The red monkeys have been changed to boxing champions who will turn and fight the player head on. Many of the apes also have specific weaknesses to exploit. The missile pack monkeys are still packing heavy firepower, but their backpacks slow them down considerably, allowing you to close the distance more easily. The black spectacled monkeys stand still while shooting and take a moment to reload. Jumping over the bullets and attacking them from above is the best way to catch them. The basic gameplay loop remains intact and the changes made do a good job of progressing the series forward. On occasion you'll come across some secret or special monkeys that offer up some unique tests. A wizard warps around in this section of Simeon Citadel, conjuring up an unlimited number of enemies. You'll need to navigate through this group and whack him with the super hoop before he can teleport away. Other monkeys can be deceiving, like these ones who poke their heads out of small holes. At first I thought you needed a specific gadget, but you simply have to time the net swing just right. Ape Escape 2 is certainly more difficult than its predecessor, and this comes down to a number of changes that reduce the margins for error. The cookie dispensers have been removed completely from later levels, and while Pipochi can give you a spare cookie or quick triple jump to help out, it's not wise to use him as a crutch. Cookie drops from enemies are rare, and the game likes to keep you at a maximum of 4 lives. If you lose them all, you'll have to restart a level and catch the monkeys all over again. Some of the regular enemies will also be a real thorn in your side. The Porkies and Wax Queens are easy pushovers, but further down the line, foes like the Flame Porky and Barbell Bombers require multiple hits to defeat. Other returning enemies like the Monkey UFOs are much easier to deal with, as they no longer fly around out of reach. Most of the gadgets are also carried over from the first game, with a small handful of new additions. The water cannon is pretty straightforward, simply rotate the stick to put out fires blocking your path. 
The Magnus is easily the best new tool of the bunch, as it contributes to platforming, combat and a light bit of puzzle solving. Attaching Hikaru to moving platforms by pointing the stick adds a new dimension to the climbing, and the same is also true of ripping off metal armour from enemies. You can also use it to pull platforms or bombs into place. However, most of the other gadgets don't share this versatility. The Hoverflyer feels a bit stiff this time. I'm not sure if this is down to animation changes, but it takes a brief moment to ascend when you first activate the gadget. The weakest and most superficial of the bunch is the Banana Boomerang. I only used it when the game asked me to, baiting monkeys out of these random tree houses. Still, none of them control poorly, thanks to the continued use of the dual analog sticks. In terms of level design, things have narrowed a fair bit. Some levels still make use of a non-linear format, but many rely on a branch structure. There are side tangents and some hidden nooks and crannies to catch monkeys, but for the most part you'll always be pushing forward. Castle Frightmare is one of the more basic levels. You start on the outside, head through the main gates, then run around in a circle with some side corridors and hidden areas along the way. Enter the Monkey, essentially Tranquil Temple 2.0, involves a main passage through the main building that leads you back round to the starting area. You can also venture behind the waterfall or to another outdoor area. In Ape Escape 2, the number of monkeys needed to clear the stage rises much more quickly, with 9 to catch as early as the 4th level. In effect, most of the stages rely on familiar settings, shuffling the order around and adding in a new one on occasion. Environments like Panic Pyramid and Pirate Isle are very standard fare for the platforming genre, though thanks to the gadgets, Ape Escape 2 can still rise above lesser releases. On your first run through the pyramid, you'll need the RC car to activate switches and open gates, but on the second you can use the water cannon to bypass one gate completely. Instead of the opening stages, the dinosaurs are saved for later with the Lost World, which adds in some more precise platforming for good measure. Other stages sit in the exact same place and not always for the better. Skyscraper City is placed in a similar spot as the original towards the end, but this time the level features a darker, less appealing visual style that makes running through it a bit tedious, despite some challenging moments. Some of the levels do fall flat, but the sequel still has other elements to fall back on. The vehicles have received some upgrades and you'll make use of them more often. The raft controls just as well as it did before, same with the tank in the urban levels, but how about a snowmobile to chase down monkeys on the slopes? It's as if they took Ski Kids Racing and turned it into a set piece in the main game. The submarine is also a novel idea, switching up the pacing as you blast enemies and catch monkeys by firing torpedoes. Making use of the right stick to ascend or descend is a major improvement on the original game. Piloting a mech is fine for a short while, though it is rather slow and forced to rely on a melee attack against other mechs with laser cannons. It would have been cool to have a flying vehicle in the mix, but that is mostly left to the hoverflyer. Arguably the biggest evolution in Ape Escape 2 are the boss fights. Spectre has promoted some of his runaway simians to higher ranks who boast their own colours, personalities and fighting styles. Rather than fighting them at the end of a level, they each have their own stages, which challenge Hikaru in varying ways. You'll take on Blue Monkey in a makeshift traffic stop with crumbling bridges. The super hoop is the best tool here, allowing you to avoid falling and knocking him off his bike to whack with the stun club. Pink Monkey is a full-on karaoke cheese fest, where you hurry up to the stage to land a hit. Red Monkey takes place in a boxing arena where you dodge his attacks until he gets dizzy. Yellow Monkey is the only one outside of Spectre that you fight twice, with the second encounter growing to a gargantuan size. After avoiding both debris and being eaten, you have to chip away at his massive teeth with the slingshot. Most of the bosses involve waiting for the opportune moment to strike, but giving them their own stages makes each one stand out. Some of the best changes in Ape Escape 2 are applied to the background design. The Spectre coins have been removed, and collectible coins no longer grant an extra life, instead being used on the gotcha machine in the travel station hub. Simply collect 10 coins, whack the button, and you'll receive a range of unlockables including concept art, soundtracks, game hints and other items. Some of the comics are amusing with the English translations, though having to read the monkey fables on plain text isn't very appealing. This is a good way of expanding on the game's feature sets, with the free minigames also being unlocked here. Sadly, all three are a mixed bag this time. Dance Monkey Dance is pretty crap, a rhythm game where you match the moves using the twin analogue sticks. Monkey Soccer is a bare-bones version of FIFA and Pro Evolution Soccer, and while Monkey Climber is the best of the three, it won't tide you over for long. 
After making your way through the urban stages, you'll reach another familiar site, Moonbase, which is essentially a reworked spectre land. This gauntlet is longer in length and much more challenging than the original. Spectre's flying fortress had some difficult platforming towards the end, but the moon base has multiple sequences with narrow jumps that get trickier on the way through. With the reduced amount of lives and cookies in the level, it's a real endurance test with patience being key to success. Hanging back and picking off the regular enemies one by one is the best approach, with the monkeys themselves taking multiple hits to knock off their spacesuits. Upon reaching the top of the moon base, you'll take on the boss, which is somewhat similar to the first game with a few added bells and whistles. Spectre's robot can now grab Hikaru, launch homing missiles, smash parts of the platform, and requires you to rip off a shield before going for the weak points. Predictably, Spectre escapes again and you are tasked with catching the remaining monkeys. The second round of the scavenger hunt has a slight twist, the use of secret areas that can be discovered in the first person view rather than the monkey radar. While it does expand the monkey hunt and overall length of the experience, having to go back through all the areas in each level with a fine tooth comb may prove tiresome for some players. The longer the stage, the more the pacing starts to drag, with the last monkey in a stage often taking a while to find. After gathering up a grand total of 300 apes, the final fight with Spectre is split down the middle for me. The smaller arena and basic aesthetics fail to impress, but the boss battle ends up being much more difficult, a fitting climax to the entire game. Spectre still launches energy blasts like he did in the original, but this time you have to watch out for energy rings that close around Hikaru. It's best to stay close to Spectre as he floats around, ready to land a hit with the magic punch, then a follow up when he's down on the ground. After making the catch, Hikaru escapes back to Earth, crash landing in the Professor's lab to end the game. Spike makes a brief appearance as well as being playable on New Game Plus with all the gadgets from the start if you're so inclined. Years later in 2009, Ape Escape 2 inspired an animated series produced by Frederator Studios, but outside of that the game didn't maintain a huge amount of popularity. Reviews and retrospectives are pretty few and far between on YouTube. That's the mark of a sequel that didn't really push the boundaries or leave any lasting legacy, something that many other PS2 sequels delivered in spades. Instead, the game sticks to the tried and true, keeping the fans on board until the close of the trilogy. Ape Escape 3 arrived in the final years of the PlayStation 2 in 2006. A portable remake of the first game, entitled On The Loose, had arrived on the PlayStation Portable the previous year, but it was met with very mediocre reviews. It was up to the third mainline entry to carry the series forward. Luckily, it was able to do just that making some good improvements on the second game while getting the balance just right. I never played Ape Escape 3 when it first came out, but I do remember watching many gameplay videos and wanting to get my hands on it. Years later, I finally bagged myself a copy, with the title being somewhat rare on the physical market. It is often priced higher than most PlayStation 2 titles, though luckily it remains playable on older versions of the PS3. The game was rated for release on PS4, but it never surfaced on that console. Ape Escape 3 follows Satoru and Sayaka, known as Kei and Yumi in other versions, who are tasked with stopping Spectre's latest scheme, using a nefarious TV program to control the minds of anyone watching. This time around, the super-intelligent monkey is joined by Dr. Tomoki, who contributes to the dastardly plan alongside the main antagonist. This lays the groundwork for the most referential tone and presentation of the series, a wider range of angles and techniques are used in the cutscenes, which maintain the same short length, with the voice acting falling more in line with Ape Escape 1. It's still a cheesy story, but it doesn't go for a full-on cartoonish tone. Every level parodies a specific production such as Titanic and Enter the Dragon. For the first time, you can choose between the two characters, with Sayaka being a pseudo-easy mode. Every so often, a monkey will be smitten by the singer's star power, allowing for an easy catch. We waste no time grabbing the first monkey, a quick introduction for new players, before getting stuck into the 28 stages. The look and style of Ape Escape 3 feels more refined, merging the blocky style of Ape Escape 1 with the fluid animations of 2. The variety of environments has reached a peak, with some very colourful graphics to match. The soundtrack is still on top form as well, crafting a distinctive identity for every level. The 
The starting stage, Seaside Resort, is very easy on the eyes, with some solid water effects for the time. You'll notice that the levels grow far more diverse and ambitious over time, while also swapping between linear and non-linear settings. Midnight Bayside and Apes in Toyland feature multiple rooms that connect to a central location, and Formidable Fleet, one of the most extravagant stages, features moving planes at high altitudes. At several points you'll continue to make use of vehicles, which do vary in quality. The raft is back, and the mech has been upgraded to a faster moving version with a boost attack. It takes a moment to get used to the controls, but it's so much better than simply swinging a mallet. You'll also get to drive a race car, but this is easily the weakest aspect of the title. The speed and turning feels very unwieldy, and drifting will often cut your momentum quickly. It's best to knock out the monkeys in their own vehicles and move on. Monkey behaviour has seen several changes and updates. For starters, they can fly into rage mode, which twists the catching cycle into a quick mini-duel. The player can take advantage of this lapse in focus to bring the net down, but if you aren't careful, the monkeys may end up knocking a gadget out of your hands and using it against you. This isn't too bad for the stun club, but a monkey with the all-important net is much more dangerous. They can actually pull a reverse 180 and catch the protagonist, sending him right back to the TV station for a restart. This surprise really caught me off guard the first time, and the alteration may not sit well with every player. Having to run through the entire stage all over again may be frustrating for some. While playing, I felt the need to be on my guard if the monkeys ever got a hold of the net, and when you combine the relatively short length of the levels with the higher speed of the experience, it didn't become too annoying. On top of the wide range of outfits and hand-to-hand -hand combat moves, the apes are also strapped into various functions as you work your way through. Some have been given angel wings and bows to attack from a distance, some of the spectacled monkeys are now immune to stun club strikes, and by the end, others are strapped into dangerous mech suits. Much like the first two games, Ape Escape 3 is keen to challenge the player at many points. The gadget count has been shrunk down heavily from previous titles. The magnet, banana boomerang, water cannon and magic punch have all been removed. It's true that this lower count does reduce the complexity of the puzzles and environmental challenges, but it also allows the game to keep things moving while cutting down on the menu usage. This is facilitated by pressing the face buttons multiple times during the action. Rather than having to assign gadgets in the menu, you can quickly cycle through all of them with the gadget you select becoming the default option until changing again. This is a highly streamlined and efficient solution that makes the entire package flow along nicely. You'll still make regular use of every gadget to overcome obstacles, from hitting switches with the catapult to the hoverflyer for clearing gaps. The monkey radar also gets plenty of use, especially towards the end of the game. As you play through the title, the levels lay the groundwork for the best new feature, transformations. By holding down the R1 and R2 buttons and choosing from a menu, Satoru and Sayaka can morph into a range of personas that grant them new abilities, more rapid attacks, and other useful functions. All seven transformations are governed by a green meter in the top left corner, with the player gathering morph energy from boxes to refill the meter more quickly. Typically lasting for 30 seconds, transformations provide a genuinely novel and new way to play. Rather than being an optional gimmick, they offer new scenarios while aiding you in catching monkeys. By collecting morph energy and avoiding water, you can make your time limits last a lot longer, which is definitely one of the most rewarding things to do. The only downside is how they can make things a bit easy in places. Some personas offer improved damage resistance, and in the case of the Cyber Ace in the final levels, the ability to capture multiple monkeys at once. Still, all of them are very fun to use, even if some get more use than others. The opening Knight persona ended up being used the least in my playthrough, boasting a hefty sword swing and a spinning strike. Other transformations are much more useful. Wild West Kid brings some rapid-fire ranged combat to the series, which is far more active and engaging than using the slingshot. The Miracle Ninja and Dragon Kung Fu Fighter are fast and lethal, allowing the player to take on the tougher enemies head-on. The former also allows you to parkour across narrow ropes, which you'll need to do several times. The Genie Dancer is the most oddball of the bunch. You can have the floating spirit access locked areas and make the monkeys dance uncontrollably. Every persona is capped off by a unique animation for catching the escaped apes. Spectre's band of lieutenants are back with a range of varied set pieces. Of course, the personas are factored in to great effect. While you can take on each boss with nothing but the stun club if need be, it's a lot more satisfying to lay waste to the opposition when clad in a fast-moving outfit. 
White Monkey is fairly straightforward, simply run forward over the bridge and whack the weak point on the side of the robot. Blue Monkey involves the cowboy persona. As the boss rides around on his trademark motorbike, you'll need to shoot him off to deal some damage. Yellow Monkey seems to be fairly standard fare at first, but using the ninja persona to climb up and drop a giant lamp on her head is a great way to mix up the encounter. Pink Monkey continues her karaoke streak, but teleporting around the stage and putting on a deadly shield forces players to pay attention. Finally, Red Monkey is arguably the most cinematic of the bunch. It's a great homage to classic martial arts films as you take him on in a circular arena and eventually land the final blow, sending the boss flying out of the top floor. In keeping with the game's love of Hollywood cinema, each super attack is marked by an animated comic flash for some extra impact. On the other side, Ape Escape 3 keeps all the components that worked in the previous outing, especially when it comes to unlockables. At the TV station hub, all the important items are there. The level select, minigame corner, monkey directory and training rooms are easily accessible. When you go downstairs, you'll find several shops that continue to make use of the coin system. Ape Escape 3 will often shower you with tens of coins at once, so you'll never have too much trouble saving up. One key change is being able to buy cookies to replenish Satoru's health, or even purchase extra lives to avoid getting a game over. This takes an element that was slightly off balance in the second game and fixes it. Cookies drop often enough when you're low on health, but not so frequently that the difficulty becomes trivial. The one piece of the package that does feel pretty insignificant is the Simeon Cinema. Every so often you'll stumble across a film camera with a button to hop on. Doing so allows you to create some short clips of the monkeys in each level, eventually cutting them together at the TV station hub. This feature is purely experimental and doesn't contribute to any wider completion tasks, making it feel quite shallow. The three mini-games each have their own enjoyable moments. Monkey C, Monkey Fro seems to take inspiration from the home run mode in Super Smash Bros. Spinning the right stick swings the monkey around, building enough momentum to launch for the best distance. Ultimate Ape Fighter is a well-made nod to fighting games with attack moves mapped to different stick directions, but by far the best minigame is saved for last. Metal Gear Solid Snake Escape is one of the best sideshows ever made for any title and a loving tribute to a fellow PlayStation franchise. In a slimmed down version of the wildly popular stealth IP, you'll take control of Peepo Snake, who infiltrates the enemy base to destroy Metal Gear and rescue a captured solid snake. Enemy vision cones, surveillance cameras, on-site procurement of ammo and health items, and alert phases are all present and accounted for. Thanks to multiple stages, simple yet straightforward controls, and a set of unlockable monkey tags, this minigame offers far more than any other in the Ape Escape trilogy. It was matched only by a similar foray from Metal Gear Solid 3 in 2004. In that release, Naked Snake is tasked with capturing monkeys in the jungles of Russia, which marked a wild change of pace from that game's serious tone. Nowadays, it's extremely rare to see fellow developers pay tribute to each other, but Ape Escape 3 delivered a stellar effort on that count. After taking out Dr. Tomochi in the mech suit and causing him to change his ways, we make our way to the Space TV Fortress, which boasts a whopping 40 monkeys to catch, alongside some more references to Star Wars. When you do reach the top, the final boss feels so much larger and more climactic than the second game, with the first stage taking place on a floating platform against a giant robot. Transforming into the Cyber Ace and narrowly dodging missile strikes, you'll take apart the weak spots one at a time, leaving only the head remaining. It puts a new spin on a previous boss fight without resorting to a similar setup. The second half is a bit threadbare, taking place on a flat arena, but Spectre himself still offers up a fair challenge. On victory, Dr. Tomochi enters the scene to activate the self-destruct sequence, while Satoru and Sayaka hurry to the escape pods. This marks the end of the base game. The hunt for the remaining monkeys also gets the balance right, implementing the final persona and keeping the pace from becoming too slow. By dressing up as a monkey and using the radar, you can find secret rooms hidden around the levels. Inside each are four monkeys ready to be captured. In this instance, Japan Studio successfully solved the problem of Ape Escape 2's scavenger hunt, while also maintaining an efficient playthrough. Rather than searching every area multiple times, it's much easier to locate the last four monkeys in a level, allowing you to quickly move on to the next one. The total monkey count may be higher at over 400, but you'll find yourself more compelled to catch all of them. In keeping with tradition, we have a final fight with Spectre, which improves on the second game further. 
You have a varied arena with falling platforms that can knock you out of transformations, and a set of rapid, challenging attacks from the antagonist that really test your reflexes. It wraps up the trilogy with a strong final flourish. Some of the new features are quite gimmicky, but Ape Escape 3 is easily on par with the original game. The title is incredibly enjoyable as a platformer, and chops out all the items that didn't work in Ape Escape 2. It's just too bad that Japan Studio were never able to expand on this solid third game. Ape Escape would never receive another mainline entry, and while it did proceed on a smaller scale back in Japan, it wasn't able to recapture the same critical acclaim of the original PS1 release. Things continued with several spin-offs, Ape Academy, Million Monkeys Racing, Saru Saru Big Mission, the series stayed very close to its roots. The last we heard of the franchise here in the West was Ape Quest, an experimental downloadable title, and PlayStation Move Ape Escape in 2010, an attempt to tie the series in with the titular motion controller. This on-rails effort wasn't what the fans were looking for, and faded away quickly. The monkeys themselves would continue to make guest appearances in the likes of PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale, and most recently in Astro Playroom. Clearly, Ape Escape was still a part of the Sony Pantheon, but the console giant simply refused to do anything with it. With the large success of Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy and Spyro Reignited Trilogy, surely Ape Escape deserves the same treatment. We were teased several times through the years, once after Ape Escape 3 came out, a second time in 2016 with The Year of the Monkey, and once more in 2019 for the franchise's 20th anniversary. Ultimately, Ape Escape was left behind when Sony and the wider gaming industry moved away from younger audiences, and that's a shame. There should be room for both mature stories and more simple releases that offer a short, fun experience. Nintendo still carries the family-friendly mantra, but Sony and Microsoft have shifted far in their quest for maximum adult retention. Ape Escape went from being a highly acclaimed and pioneering effort to just another platformer buried under countless others. The audience gradually shrunk to Japan only, and the creators never returned to mainline entries, instead focusing efforts on the highly forgettable Knack. Japan Studio would finally close in April 2021, after more than two decades supporting Sony and countless games developed, being merged with fellow studio team Asobi. Ape Escape may now be a long dormant franchise, but perhaps someday it will finally be brought back to the masses on PlayStation hardware. Thanks for watching.